Now let's pick up with our understanding of supply and demand on the 3.2 lecture. Now let's take a look at another model that economists have come up with to help us think our way through the issues dealing with markets. So the first thing we're going to, we're going to take a look at is a model called the circular flow model or diagram. And it shows two markets, both for uh, the factor market and the product market. Remember, the factor market was the language we used to describe the market for resources. So the market to hire workers, the market to buy natural resources, the market to buy capital equipment, and the market to find entrepreneurs to you know, run a business. Okay, So that's the factor market. The product market is both the physical goods market, selling market and the um, services market where you're selling to the final consumer who's going to consume it for their own personal use. So, we're going to find out that we're going to use two markets, the product market and the factor market, which I've already um, described. And let's now go to the next slide so we can um, see that we're going to continue on with our circular flow and talk about who the participants are. So the participants will be consumers. They will uh, consumers will supply the factors of production, such as labor. Um, so consumers actually are on two sides of the market at the same time. So every one of us as a consumer probably has a job. So you as a consumer supply yourself to the factor market. So you are a supplier there, but when you go to Publix, you are a consumer because you're buying from them. And the people who work at Publix, they're the suppliers, right? So in the factor market, the business is the demander and the individual consumer is the supplier, but in the final goods and services market, the firm is the seller or supplier, and the consumer is the buyer or consumer. Now, how about business firms? Where do they come in? Business firms produce goods and services for the product market, meaning the final goods and services market. And they use goods and services that they purchased in the factor market. So now business firms are also buyers, or you can think of them as consumers in quote unquote quote marks, right? They are consumers of labor, of capital, of natural resources, the land resources, or entrepreneurship. They consume those things by buying them and bringing them to their factory, using them up in the factory, and then they produce the good for the product market. And then, of course, governments, they are on the side. They are part of a market system, but not the dominant part. They will also acquire resources, such as think about um, a government providing a school for elementary school kids. So what's the resources they need? Well, they need teachers. So they have to go to the labor market and for a specialized form of labor called being a school teacher. They also need a building. So they need to go to the construction market and find construction companies to build the school. They also need um, you know, several other kinds of, they don't need entrepreneurship because the government owned school doesn't it? have a entrepreneur, but they need the other three um, factors, the capital equipment, they need their natural resources, and they need the workers. So governments are also involved in the circular flow in the market system. And then last but not least, international participants. International participants participate on both sides of the market. They supply imports, meaning that, let's, let's use a, a, an example. Um, Germany builds a Mercedes in Stuttgart, Germany, and then puts it on a boat and ships it to the United States. So they're being a supplier and they're supplying an import to the US. An import means that domestically we have purchased a good from a foreign source. So we import the car into the United States. Now, of course, the Germans also purchase exports. The United States exports Boeing airplanes and Apple computers to Germany. So in that market, the United States is an exporter and Germany would be the importer. Every country in the world participates to some degree in these international markets of either buying things from foreigners or selling things to foreigners. The closest example we can come to a country that has cut itself off completely from trade with the outside world, and even it has not, is North Korea. North Korea has made a deliberate attempt to insulate itself from influence from the outside world. But even the North Koreans trade with China. They don't trade with the United States, but they do trade with China. So even the North Koreans have to have some amount of trade. 
and uh, North Korea has paid a terrible price in levels of income for their people in the fact that uh, because they don't trade and because they don't rely on markets, they rely way too much on government and government control inside North Korea. North Korea is dramatically poorer than South Korea, which took the exact opposite decision. South Korea got heavily involved in international participation. They participate with the United States, for instance. We all know that what the, the, um, the South Koreans produce Samsungs, so that would be what phones and TVs and washing machines and dryers, and you can see them in stores all over the United States. We purchase these uh, Korean products. Uh, Kia cars, um, Hyundai cars, Genesis, which is a division of Hyundai, um, is, provides the, pro produces their luxury cars. So they're exporting those things to the United States when they're not building them here in the United States. They also build them locally as well, making things even more complicated. But at this point, I just want you all to recognize that countries around the world participate in these markets and buy and sell. And South Korea, because they participate in these um, international markets, is dramatically richer than is North Korea. If you go back to that list on incomes around the world, we saw that the average income in um, South Korea is a little over $30,000 per person, uh, putting that right on the threshold of being a first world nation, whereas North Korea is down in the you know, much, much lower. They're clearly a, a significantly poorer nation. On our last slide in this particular section, we're going to be talking about the circular flow. So uh, in a diagram, we've already talked about it in um, words, but it's important to see the diagram. So first of all, we're going to start with the business firms. As we can see over here, highlighted with my little red um, laser pointer, business firms are producing goods and services and they're supplying them to the product market. Now that means they're going to be going there to sell something. Now, the product market, of course, the goods finally end up in the homes of consumers, right? So the consumers demand the goods and services, the firms supply the goods and services. Now that's a one-way flow arrow, right? So what do consumers push in the other direction? I think it's pretty obvious that something has to be going back in the other direction, and yes, it is. Consumers produce, uh, rather supply the factors of production, and the predominant one, the easiest one to recognize is labor. Consumers supply their labor to the factor market by offering themselves, uh, their, their labor is offered to business firms to use in factories or businesses somewhere. And then of course, this uh, continues on to the business firm. The business firm demands these things, the individual consumer supplies these things. So you can see where the term circular flow comes from. We can see that this has a nice circular flow all the way around. It turns out business firms absolutely need consumers to purchase their product. Otherwise, it all builds up an inventory and the company eventually goes bankrupt. It has to have consumers purchase their products. But consumers, unless they're going to live on their own subsistence farm, must have firms to hire their labor. So that's what we call the circular flow. Both parties are producing something that the other party needs. So business firms cannot go it alone without consumers, and consumers cannot go it alone without business firms, unless, of course, they're willing to live on a subsistence farm. But as I pointed out, I mean, you would be so poor doing that, that virtually everyone in the world, when given a chance, abandons their subsistence farm, moves to a city, and offers themselves as, you know, as their, la offers their labor for sale in a labor market somewhere, and instead purchases the things that they want. Uh, it's, it takes place virtually everywhere that it's permitted to take place. And then of course we mentioned that governments also um, are get involved in the factor markets. We use the example of a government run um, elementary school has to hire workers and has to have fa it has to have schools built, right? So they, um, they purchase those um, factors in the factor market as well and governments get involved with both consumers, like in the example of school, uh, of setting up schools. Clearly, these households, the consumers in their households use the government schools, and also business firms use things that government produces. When government produces, um, for instance, um, court systems, in order for business people, if, the, if any one of them tries to um, uh, what, renege on a contract, then you would sue that person. Where do you sue them? Well, obviously in a government-run court, right? Or if a business person harms you with a bad product and you want to sue them, then of course you do that in a government-run court. So people deal with governments all the time in uh, 
even in market systems. And then last but not least, we talked about the circular flow back and forth with international participants. International participants is just another name for foreign business firms. Foreign business firms produce goods for the product market. I use the example of Samsung and um, Hyundai from South Korea and also Mercedes from Germany. But of course, there's large numbers of companies that uh, countries and companies that Americans deal with. But also, um, these mar international participants also deal with the factor markets. Uh, while uh, it's more difficult to participate in labor markets across international borders because you need to get a work permit that's issued by a government, so those things don't flow very easily. But certainly the resources do, like if a foreign firm is producing um, machinery, like Komatsu, that's a Japanese company that produces heavy construction equipment. I'm sure you've seen their, you know, on different construction sites, you've seen Komatsu backhoes and Komatsu bulldozers. And so the Japanese firm is selling not into a final product market, but into a factor market, the factor market for capital. Um, they also, foreign firms also provide natural resources like Shell and BP. I presume you've heard of those brands. They sell gasoline. Well, Shell is a Dutch um, company from the Netherlands and they produce, or rather they dig, you know, they drill for the oil overseas, they refine it and they sell it in the, partly in the United States. And so does BP. BP is a British firm and they've got oil wells everywhere from Saudi Arabia, all across Iraq. Uh, they've got it in the North Sea. You know, BP is a worldwide um, um, oil company and they produce the oil overseas and then they sell it partly in the United States and also of course sell it in other markets as well. So the point I want you all to, to recognize We've talked about in words how the circular flow works, and now we see when you put it on a diagram why we call it a circular flow, because we see that there are activities flowing from business firms to consumers, and then from consumers back to business firms, and also from international markets doing the exact same thing, both selling into the United States and purchasing from the United States, both in the final goods markets, the product markets, and the factor markets or the resource markets in order to facilitate their business life as well. So this um, ends uh, the, the, the 3.1 section. We'll be moving on to 3.2. So supply and demand, as we've already pointed out, the two sides of a market transaction have to take place. You have to have a buyer and you have to have a seller. And we call those supply and demand. So the supply side is the ability and the willingness to sell a product or produce a product of specific quantity of a good at alternative prices in a given time period. Ceteris paribus. Now I'm going to go ahead and jump to the very bottom. Ceteris paribus, this is the Latin term. It means the assumption that nothing else is changing. This is a very important assumption and it's used in all scientific work. Just picture in your mind if someone asked a scientist, what is the boiling point of water? And the scientist would say the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, ceteris paribus. Or if you're using Fahrenheit, the water boils at 212 degrees, ceteris paribus. What does that mean? Well, that means we're assuming, we're talking about we're doing it at sea level, we're doing it with pure water. Because if you took a glass of water and carried it up to Denver, which is a mile high you know, in elevation, and you started boiling it, you'd find out it boils at way less than 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees of Fahrenheit. So if someone was doing an experiment in um, Denver and said, oh, water only boils at 95 degrees Celsius instead of 100, and someone working at sea level said, no, it boils at 100, not 95, that would not be a legitimate scientific argument, right? Because you've now changed the elevation at which you took the measurements. Now, measured at sea level, all water should boil at the same um, temperature, assuming, of course, it's of the same salinity. If water has more salt in it, then it takes even more temperature to boil it. My whole point of all that is, is to recognize all scientific statements have to be made ceteris paribus. In other words, holding all else constant and only changing the one item. So what is the one item being changed? As we see here in the statement, it's alternative prices. So if the prices change, how much do business people want to change their selling? 
And the same thing is going to be for demand, only now we're looking at the buyer's side of things. The ability, uh, demand is the ability and willingness to buy specific quantities of good at alternative prices in a given period of time, again, ceteris paribus. So we're looking at a person whose income does not change, whose tastes and preferences don't change. Nothing is changing except we're looking at alternative prices for the same good and finding out how the person is going to respond to those. As you might suspect, given the law of demand, the quantity of a good demanded in the given time period increases as its price falls and vice versa. Now this should make pretty much common sense to everybody, right? People prefer lower price goods to higher price goods. That's because in a world of scarcity, you can't have everything you want, but if the price on something you want goes down, you can have more of it and that makes you happier, right? So it's perfectly logical why people respond to the law of demand the way it is. And vice versa, if the price goes up, then obviously given that you have a limited budget, things are scarce, you can't have everything you want, the price rises, it's not as easy to get a hold of the good, and therefore the amount that you want to buy goes down. So this is referred to as an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. In other words, they're moving in opposite direction. When the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. When the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. Now, let's take a look at um, demand, um, illustrating demand using either a demand schedule or a demand curve. Both of them show the consumer's quantity demanded of a good at alternative prices. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Here is a demand schedule, and from it, we're gonna build the famous demand curve that everyone knows about in economics. So let's do, um, this is a good that sells for, uh, there's several different prices. Uh, we can charge 50 for it, 45, 40, 35, and all the way down to $10. Now, if the price is 50, according to the demand schedule, this person only wants to buy one of them. But if the price is 45, they would be willing to buy two. But if the price kept falling to 40, they'd buy three, and on the down, if the price was as low as $10, they would want a lot of these things, they'd be willing to buy 20, okay? So picture in your mind, I don't know, let's make this a lobster dinner. At $50, I think most of us realize this is gonna be a once a year special treat, like on an anniversary or something like that. You'd buy maybe one lobster dinner per year. But as the price of lobster dinners falls, let's say especially if it went down to $10, what if you could get literally the same quality of lobster dinner for $10? How many lobsters do you think people would start to order? That's actually cheaper thing nowadays. You go to a restaurant, uh, a hamburger costs $16. If you could buy a lobster dinner for 10, you'd be doing this all the time. This is showing that you're going out 20 weeks out of the year, you're going out for lobster dinners. So. The point I want you all to realize is, and I just made up the example of lobsters, it doesn't matter what the example is. As long as it's a good to you, meaning that you want it and are willing to pay for it, we know we have this inverse relationship. The lower the price, the more you want to consume. The higher the price, the less you want to consume. Now let's convert this into a graph. Here we have the axes of a graph. On the vertical axis, we have the price. On the horizontal axis, we have the quantity, and we always do it that way in economics. And then we start to plot out our line. Now, we plot out the line by putting dots down on the graph that represent the data we have. For instance, here's the first piece of data. It's, what, $50 and one item sold. So let's take a look at this dot right here. You noticed horizontally, or rather on the vertical axis, it lines up with $50, and on the horizontal axis, Oh, there it is. It lines up with one lobster. So that's where that dot came from. What about this dot? Well, it came from this set of data. There are 45 is the price and two is the quantity. And then on and on. I'm not going to go through each one of them. I think you all ever have remembered this from previous classes. The demand curve is constructed not from a solid line. It, ap it appears to be a solid line after we construct it. But what it comes from is individual dots which represent on a two-dimensional graph data from two different columns. And so as long as you have the data, you can plot out the curve. And then of course, once you've done all that, you start to fill it in with a solid line. So I'm not gonna, again, this is uh, <clears throat> graphically showing it. And then with the green final line, we connect up all the dots and we construct what's known as the demand curve. You notice it's downward sloping. It will always be downward sloping for demand. It's hard to imagine that 
if the price went up, you would find it more attractive, right? You find things more attractive when people put them on sale, not when you raise the price. 